we're going to get into what happened that night in a second, Robert, uh, is that uh, Spike Lee tweeted where he thought uh, your family resided. That's and, right. And what happened? Well, uh, that, that family was actually the McLean family, and they had to o leave. Oops. Yeah, oops, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, they had to leave their home. That was actually the night uh, I was on CNN's air because the Black Panthers had put a price on George's head, and I thought that really crossed the line. I had been warned myself about my address being uh, compromised uh, by Florida law enforcement, and uh, there comes a point when enough is enough. But, yeah, Spike Lee and others uh, tweeted addresses so that I guess whoever was going to come exact revenge knew exactly where to go. And Al Sharpton uh, famously said if your brother was not arrested and charged, he was going to, quote, take things to another level, close quote, whatever that meant. That's right. And, you know, who, who's to say? I can't get into his frame of mind, but, you know, Al Sharpton, uh, uh, others have, have had their, their hands in the bucket throwing stones at our family for a really long time, and we're trying to take back some control of how we're portrayed uh, in America and in the world, and we'd like to be Americans, and we'd like what comes from this in the end for all uh, people who hear the name Zimmerman to, uh, if, if there were fair questions that needed to be asked about elements of a crime or that night, to examine them as fair questions, but to really think about what you did to a family, you know, people collectively did to a family, and that it could happen to anyone. Okay, let's go back to the night, uh, Robert Zimmerman. Um, do, would you concede at the very least, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Sanford police did not investigate what happened that night as thoroughly as they should have? Well, you know, what I would concede at the very least is that there were some questions initially that I heard um, from my recollection, uh, such as, you know, why was uh, George not tested for alcohol or drugs, or, or to those people asking those questions, to their understanding he was not. Uh, there were some questions asked about this stand your ground law. What I would concede is that some of those answers were not immediately forthcoming. And uh, we know that in our society there's a reason for that. You know, you don't want to compromise investigations. And I think that that uh, disconnect sort of between the time that the questions were being asked and when they were being answered caused a lot of speculation and a lot of race in inflection. In I'm story. talking to Robert Zimmerman, Jr., the brother of uh, George Zimmerman. So, Robert, what you're telling me is that the police did conduct a thorough investigation. The news of how thorough that investigation did not get out until later. Exactly. Um, was your brother polygraphed? Uh, it's my understanding it's come out in court, uh, at least his, his attorneys brought forth, and I, I don't know, I'm not an attorney, whether it's admissible or not in a final stand your ground hearing or courtroom, but it's my understanding that he took uh, voice stress analysis uh, test, which is the new kind of polygraph that listens for signs of deception in mm -hmm. the voice, mm -hmm. and he took uh, more than one, I believe three, and they all three sh uh, showed no sign of deception. And contrary to what was reported at the time, uh, Robert Zimmerman, your brother was, in fact, uh, handcuffed and was briefly arrested. Uh, he, was, he was detained. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Now, um, the, um, the defense has been, as you know, that he was, uh, saw somebody suspicious and, uh, and called 911, uh, and uh, the dispatcher instructed him not to get out of the car, and he, quote, defied the dispatcher's instructions, which is the line that a lot of people... Uh, have been saying. What is your interpretation of what you think happened that night? Well, I think that what the evidence shows, and, and uh, just taking from what you said, there is a misconception that there was some kind of a, a, an, an instruction or a suggestion, don't get out of the car. To my knowledge, that never happened. Uh, George got out of his car. Uh, the dispatcher said, quote, we don't need you to do that, well, which is very different than don't get out, don't get out of the car. That's right, mm -hmm. right. He got out of his car. He didn't say, I'm getting out of my car. And this is, again, from my recollection of what I've heard that's been submitted mm -hmm. into evidence. He got out of his car. He looked, uh, he followed as, as best he could uh, Mr. Martin for the reason of getting an address. Uh, and when he was following uh, Trayvon, the dispatcher asked him, are you following him? And he said, yes. And the dispatcher replied, okay, we don't need you to do that. And then George said, okay. But a lot of media outlets cut that final okay off because that's where the story would end if it were actually reported accurately. When he said okay, he stopped in his tracks. He turned, he went right back to his car, uh, and he was the one that was in, uh, encountered mm -hmm. by Mr. Martin. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you tell us uh, the version of events as you understand them, are you doing it based on what you've read? Are you doing it based on what you've read plus what you've 
uh, learn from your brother having had a conversation with him? Well, uh, originally, I, what I refer to always is uh, the, the Pierce Morgan interview that I did, which I, I let stand as, as a body of work, you know, as a final product of what my recollection was. And we tell the truth in our family. I went on the air that night, March 29th, about a month after it happened, to tell the truth. Uh, I did speak with George uh, within 24 hours of the incident, and that's on the uh, on CNN's air. Uh, and he recounted to me exactly what had happened uh, and spoke to him, you know, several times after that. And he would uh, come forth with more details because George was very, very hurt by this. He wasn't happy about this. He, nobody in our family was relieved at this. And uh, details were forthcoming kind of slowly. But, yeah, that's from my recollection from what George told me. Now, when did George tell you about the shooting? The I believe it was 24 to 36 hours after from himself. I learned from my little sister uh, beforehand. How, and, and how did your little sister learn? Uh, my little sister lives in Florida, and she called uh, to tell me that uh, she had something very serious to share, that I had to pay attention to her. And I, I, I immediately asked her, I said, oh, my God, is someone, has someone died? thinking it was someone in my family. And she said, well, someone is dead, but it's not what you think. You know? And someone has attacked George. He was on his way to Target. And uh, he, he somehow got in some kind of uh, confrontation with this person or was confronted, and now there's a young person who died. Mm -hmm. Then you pick up the phone, you call George? George called me. Mm -hmm. And you guys talked for how long? Uh, you know, 45 minutes, somewhere. And his, his state of mind was? Sad, in a word, you know. That's the first word that comes to mind. Sad, uh, profoundly profoundly saddened, not the same George I had left just days ago. Just days ago, I was in Florida. I, I lived at the time in Virginia. George was uh, taking care of our dad in the hospital, staying overnight with him. And uh, I was ta at my family's home, running the home and taking care of our grandmother who suffers from dementia. Mm -hmm. And the George I left was not the George I was speaking to on the phone. Uh, Robert, when you had your 45-minute conversation with him, did you get into detail about what happened that night? Well, you know, it was it was about 45 minutes, and, and uh, George uh, tried to uh, convey what had happened. I had been, uh, you know, warned that this was a sensitive topic for George, obviously, and not to press him on details uh, by another family member, that he was not himself and that uh, he would be forthcoming in his own time, and he was. Uh, at, but I, at this point, was your brother uh, uh, unaware of whether he would be arrested and charged? At this point, we were all unaware. Uh, what What... Our understanding was was that this was uh, an, uh, an investigation, our understanding as a family, of what was uh, to be a uh, justified or justifiable homicide or a taking of a life in self-defense because of the fact, you know, when he called me uh, the next day, his, his ears were bleeding, his nose was broken. You know, he, re he told me all the things that had happened to him, and uh, the way we understood it, he had defended his life. Did you see him? I did not. My father saw him. My mother saw him. My sister saw him. Did I didn't you, live in Florida. Did you guys hire a lawyer? Uh, we did not. You know, and George uh, went, uh, did not invoke his Fifth Amendment rights, told the truth, told the truth under voice stress analysis, told the truth uh, despite not knowing whether there was contradictory evidence that would come to light in the future, such as a videotape, you know, showing exactly what had happened that would contradict his words. He told the truth, and that's a family value of ours. Uh, obviously, in retrospect, you realize what a huge mistake that was, uh, not, not to have consulted counter right, right away, right well, away. Well, I, th I think that, you know, our mistakes are ours to make, and I, I would have gone about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, George really believed that uh, people who take the oath, you know... He thought he had done nothing wrong, and there was no reason to get counsel. I'm sure that's what he thought. That's, that's, yeah. that's pretty accurate. When we come back, uh, there has been some uh, DNA finding of, uh, of no DNA on, uh, on the... On the uh, I'm sorry, was it Trayvon Martin had no signs of DNA on the gun? I think is that, that's is that what's what we found forward, out. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a second. We're going to stick around for a while. More KABC, and you're listening to a Larry Elder special archived interview. I'm talking to Robert Zimmerman. He is the older brother of George Zimmerman, uh, the man accused of second-degree murder in the case of the death of Trayvon Martin. Uh, Robert, what did you think when you heard President Obama say, if I had had a son, he would have looked like Trayvon? Um, you know, I think uh, President Obama, he started that statement out really well by saying that uh, the Attorney General reports to him and that he had to be real careful with what he said. But I remember him uh, interjecting himself before with Skip Lewis Gates uh, in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and, and kind of embarrassing himself, you know, ultimately. And I think that uh, 
a lot of people voted for President Obama because they believed he would be the person, finally, that would bring us beyond race for, our, for not just an election, but for our lifetimes, for our children's lifetimes. The white men's club, which was the presidents of the United States, would no longer be the white men's club. I couldn't understand how he, from the Rose Garden, uh, chose to make race so relevant. I mean, surely he wasn't referring to, to Trayvon Martin's teeth or his, you know, other physical attributes. I think he clearly made a statement about the color of his skin. Uh, it felt like a betrayal. I think it wasn't presidential. It uh, made us feel kind of bullied. I, I don't know that he would know how many people uh, can hear something like that and what kind of effect it can have to incite their mindset that, you know, yeah, yeah, even the president, you know, who uh, in effect adopted this boy as his son from the Rose Garden who George went out and, and murdered, you know, how it validates their opinion uh, or the feelings they have about that opinion. Words, you know, getting thrown around like hate, I hate the Zimmermans, those racist this or racist that. I think, uh, I think it would have been more presidential to say in our country we investigate things and uh, the courts uh, have the final say. I believe I've read... Um Robert, that your brother was a registered Democrat. That's come out recently. Yeah. That's right. And George was actually uh, a big uh, proponent uh, or, or promoter of uh, Barack Obama, trying to convince our parents to vote for Obama, me, back when Obama was running, because I think he was one of those people who mm -hmm. thought Obama was going to... Exactly what a racist would do, right? <laughs> uh, um, what, what race are you? What race do you describe? As, when you fill out a form, what do you put down? When oh, they that's, ask for race? A, that's a very interesting question. You know, the forms got more and more complicated as the years went on. It was, you know, white, black, other, and we were Hispanic. So we would ask our parents, what are we? Are we white, black? Or they'd say, well, white, because obviously you're not black, you know, and then it would become white, black, Hispanic, but Hispanic, not from here, maybe from Puerto Rico, or are you a, an Eskimo or an American Indian and a Native American? Um, we describe ourselves, we always have as Hispanic, and we didn't make distinction in our home between this race or that. We did... Uh, make some kind of distinction uh, as it related to our culture. We had, we had two cultures in our home growing up. Our mom, who's from Peru, mm -hmm. and her fluency in Spanish and all her but, Latin American. Say, say habla español? Si, habla español. And your brother? Por supuesto, habla mm -hmm. español. Mm -hmm. So you both are fluent in Spanish? Of course. Mm -hmm. So your brother was first described, as you know, as white. That's right. Uh, and then white and Jewish. Um, and uh, then white, uh, half white, half Hispanic, I've heard l lately, right. which means that President Obama is half white, half black, but no one ever says that. I, you know, that's, that's the thing is, you know, our, our father also had a mixed race son, and he happened to look like George, and he's a fellow American, and why, you know, a, a mixed race American, such as Barack Obama, who's Harvard educated, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't rise above that, that racial uh, in, in interjection of, of, of hatred and, and say something truly presidential to bring us together is a, is a mystery. It made us really feel bullied. Um, your brother must have talked to you in that 45-minute conversation about what he thought was a rise in crime in his, in his community. Uh, did he say that, and why, did, why in particular did he follow uh, Trayvon Martin? Well, he didn't talk in that conversation about what was a rise uh, in crime. Uh, we knew uh, George was on the neighborhood watch. He was a volunteer, you know, not a self-appointed captain or not a... Not, not, not a commander? Not a commander or a gun-toting cowboy or a Rambo on a mission. He was a volunteer. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, and by a lot, I mean, you know, we have to look at the statistics to speak for themselves, but there were a lot of break-ins. Uh, in that community and it was a gated community and I think that anyone who moves to a gated community thinks that that's going to be some kind of buffer or barrier to uh, that situation but in effect it wasn't that gate provided no protection and did I not hear that your brother in fact was instrumental in capturing at least one person and solving some crime of theft that took place in this community I think that he called while there was a, a crime in progress that's right uh, and and Robert the slam against your brother is that he's been a wannabe cop he's a Barney Fife he's a guy that uh, couldn't shoot straight but he always wanted to be a uh, a cop at a big city or a big uh, department like the FBI and and his uh, uh, mindset was simply one of the kind of mindset that a vigilante would have hmm. your, your reaction to that is well I, you know I, I think that George uh, he may have a little bit of a Caesar complex he's very honest himself he's very forthright himself that's why he didn't hire an attorney that's why he didn't invoke his rights that's why he went and he told people he thought were honest like cops uh, the truth um, you know, George always told the truth from the beginning, and all, any of those other descriptions had to do with furthering a narrative because there were not answers forthcoming. They really had nothing to do with George. Uh, had George been in trouble with the law before? 
he had a run in uh, in 2005 as a young person didn't make you know the wisest uh, decision at the time he he got in some kind of a uh, altercation or scuffle with with a police officer who was not identified as a police officer and later those charges were dismissed um i've read that george has black friends black buddies can you talk about that we all have black friends we all have black buddies you know uh I, I don't have any black friends. Oh, okay. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, George and I and our family, um, growing up, we had uh, a lot of white people around us, and the exception to the rule were black people. Before was this inf the, before there was an influx of uh, Latin Americans and, and immigrants who were people who also spoke Spanish like us. So we found a lot of kinship with the traditions and uh, – ways of, of the african-american community growing up in our home because we knew we were a minority and so we didn't have to look further than our own mother and in our own home to understand uh... or to have some kind of empathy with how uh... black people felt uh... growing up and uh, understood it wasn't uh... otherness it, it actually for us was more sameness with them uh... before we go to the break and we're going to invite people to call robert zimmerman uh... george zimmerman's older brother at one eight hundred two 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 five two 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 robert the significance in your mind of not finding trayvon martin's dna on the gun you know i'm not an attorney and i'm not george's attorney and i think that uh... george's attorney ha should should have the final say on what that is for me personally i've never read in anything that's been uh... admitted to court i've never heard george say nor did he say to me in my recollection ever uh... that mr martin's hands were on the gun i believe that he attempted to disarm him or moved to disarm him slid his hand on his body in combination with saying you're gonna die tonight mm -hmm. so i don't know if that's gonna be significant i'm sure it's significant to some people and robert i've heard different things about who it was uh... that uh... witnesses heard screaming that mm -hmm. night i've heard that it was your brother i've heard that it was trayvon martin who was screaming unequivocally it was my brother screaming, you know, and I, I know different people have heard from different sources, but our father right away uh, before this blew up into, into uh, the mess that it's become went to the prosecutor's office and made, swore out an affidavit, swore a statement, uh, swearing under penalty of perjury that that was his son on that uh, recording. And I know it's his voice because he sounds like me. My guest is Robert Zimmerman, Jr. He is the older brother of George Zimmerman. More of the Larry Elder Show. Of murdering Trayvon Martin. In fact, he's been charged with second degree murder. Uh, when he got charged, I'm sure you were shocked. Absolutely, yeah. April April 11th, I'll never forget the day. What did you think was going to happen? You know, I thought it was going to take uh, a lot of courage, uh, and this is just my opinion. You know, if a prosecutor was going to uh, not charge him, that would have to be a, a really, truly courageous person to do what we opine as a family would be the right thing to do, uh, a, a, an objective examination of fact and... Uh, you know, maybe perhaps uh, bothering to subpoena his medical records, uh, seeing that as relevant, and, and uh, that didn't happen. You know, instead there was a a prayer meeting uh, with the quote sweet sweet parents, and that's how uh, the prosecutor in this case decided to go about fact finding was to start off with with some kind of prayer. Brian is in Redondo Beach. Brian, you're on with the brother of George Zimmerman. His name is Robert Zimmerman. And Larry, go ahead, Brian. Hey, thanks, Larry. Um, Robert, I just want to let you know, I, I recently went through the um, the training for the Florida uh, concealed permit, mm -hmm. and I really don't see anything that your brother did that was wrong other than putting himself in a position where he may have to use his gun. Okay. Um, but he did get in a position where he had to use it, and um, I have a feeling that he's going to be acquitted. And, Larry, I was just wondering if you thought that that would result in you know, widespread civil unrest. Uh, you said widespread? No. Will, will there be the, the occasional knucklehead who's going to uh, set, set fire to a car or do something like that? Yes. But I don't think there'll be widespread. Uh, I'll tell you why, Brian. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just giving you my opinion, Robert. Your brother never should have been charged. As far as I'm concerned, the investigation that night or, or for, shortly thereafter was sufficiently thorough. As a former uh, law clerk with the DA's office here in L.A., I can tell you right now, uh, if, if your brother had not become famous and the data, the evidence that uh, had been gathered had been brought to a, uh, a DA by a detective, I've seen these things. They sit there and they say, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. 
And the DA's job is to say, well, what about the uh, what, what about the knuckles on uh, the, the alleged victim's hand? What about the fact that uh, the guy you want to bring charges uh, against has uh, cuts on his back of his head? What about this? What about this? I can't get a jury of 12 to convict him. This is not good enough. Give me something else. That's what would have happened. Never right. should have been charged. And so, Brian, I, this is not uh, this is not some slam dunk O.J. Simpson case where uh, George Zimmerman walks after butchering two people the way O.J. Simpson did. This is somebody uh, who's going to be found not guilty and should never have been tried in the first place. Uh, I completely agree with you because I've I've, wa- I've actually watched the uh, the show that actually shows George um, walking with the police to you know step by step showing what happened, and it's completely different than what the media or the, the larger media is reporting. Which leads me to believe that you have a lot of um, you know people around the country that think this was a racial thing. Mm-hmm. And when he gets off, it's going to be similar to a Rodney King getting off, you know, or not Rodney King, but, you know, when the police officers got, were acquitted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Brian and Robert, uh, Robert was very uh, adamant, uh, Brian, that uh, George did not follow Trayvon Martin. But let's assume that he did follow Trayvon Martin. Where's the law that says you can't follow somebody in your own neighborhood? Where, where's That's, that law? Well, you know, when you do the DCW training, um, there's actually a part you have to read that says, you know, if you know you're going into a situation where you're going to be, be have a confrontation, um, you should avoid that. Of course you should avoid it, but if you're the neighborhood watch guy uh, and your job is to make sure that crime is monitored in your neighborhood, that's what you're supposed to do. Right. Don't, you, I mean, don't you want people in your neighborhood to be proactive? I, I would totally agree, and, and I just think that that's what the prosecution is going to try and use, and I, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think so either. And he's got a, a permit to have a CCW? Come on. My guest is Robert Zimmerman, Jr., the older brother of George Zimmerman. Don't go away. More from the Sage right after this. Talk Radio 790 KABC. Robert Zimmerman Jr., he is the brother of George Zimmerman. He's the older brother of George Zimmerman. And we're discussing the, uh, what, what, do, what do you call it, the Trayvon Martin case? Do you call it the George Zimmerman case? What do you, what do you call it in your mind, Robert? Um, I call it the um, case that involves my brother, you know, and, and there's, uh, we're, we're his family. I think that's how we're always going to see it and I know that uh, I might get flack for that and I know that you um, you know being a man of color you went out bravely when this was all uh, initially uh, being reported and making national news and spoke out and said hey let's let's wait for the facts there might be something civil here you know there were there weren't many facts forthcoming then but I know you too got some flack about it and I had family in the area um, recommend this broadcast and I want to thank you and warn you that there will be some people as I'm sure you know that are not too happy that you have me on your air, but nonetheless, I do appreciate the opportunity today to to respond to some of those. Uh, well, I was called a lot of names, but I've been called worse by better, so uh, okay. uh, it, it's just part of the uh, part of the territory. Um, I, I would think for you and for your family, one of the turning points in this case has got to have been when President Obama publicly said, "If I had had a son, he would have looked like Trayvon." That's right. Tell me about the the impact of that uh, on you and on your family, on your brother. You well, there, there were there, it, it was almost an escalation. It was you know first uh, the attorney general was speaking about it or the spokesperson at, at DOJ, and then uh, things got serious. We had to cut ties with people. Things started escalating. Uh, then uh, you had the uh, press secretary at the White House responding uh, to the same thing, and and we thought you know perhaps this might eventually escalate to the president because the buck stops there, and then he'll remind everyone that we're a country of laws. We're based on the the concept uh, that people who are accused of any crime are innocent until proven guilty and that we have investigations to determine guilt that we're not tried by media or by public opinion but he took the low road and brought up race and it was like uh, it felt to me like someone was kicking me in the stomach that was the president of our country uh, who's supposed to, who was uh, a turning point in our history uh, the first African American president again invoking the color of his race in, in a theoretical person who doesn't even exist. Uh, it's unclear to me where your brother lives, where your father lives, where your mother lives, where you live. We have a family home, which uh, is where, which is in Florida. I think everybody knows that. I think that's you know part of the record, as as it were. It, it's the it's the uh, the the address that Spike Lee wishes he had when he tweeted uh, where your where he thought your parents lived. Well, we have that's that's the family home. That's mm-hmm. uh, George is ordered to remain uh, in Seminole County. He's not at that home. He's in hiding. Uh, he can't leave that county as it is now, as the order permits. Uh, and and the rest of you, 
uh, when this happened, did you have to move? Were you guys getting phone calls and things like that? Uh, the rest of us moved several times. We had months where our life was uh, based out of suitcases, U-Hauls, and uh, storage units, and hotels. And that's basically how we lived. Uh, some hotels would be compromised because media would descend on that hotel and everybody would have to move again. And I was in Virginia. I moved to uh, Washington, D.C., right around the time that this happened, you know, days before or days after, literally. And uh, I, I thought, you know, I'll be able to blend in here. There's a city of millions of people. No one will ever care. Uh, but I was wrong, and I was threatened in a coffee shop and in a mall, and uh, my family wanted us all to be uh, united, and I wanted to be with them because my dad had just been in the hospital, and so had my grandma. And uh, George and I had both... Uh, come together as brothers to take care of our parents when they needed us and I knew this was one of those same situations mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, when this was first reported your brother was described as white and Jewish right. and your race and religion are what our race uh, is Hispanic we're um, more mixed race you know and uh, our religion our, uh, our father was uh, Baptist race Baptist our mother is Catholic race Catholic and we grew up in a Christian home we followed uh, we went to Catholic school, all of us, at some point in our education or another, and uh, followed Catholic traditions. Mm -hmm. My father as well, you know, going to church for major holidays and things like that with the rest of the family. ¿Y se habla español? Sí, mm -hmm. hablamos español en la casa, siempre lo hemos hablado. Mm -hmm. um, the night in question, let's go back to there, uh, Robert. When the police were investigating this, is it a deal where the cops knew your brother and therefore uh, were far less inclined to be suspicious about him because they knew him, they knew that he was involved in Neighborhood Watch? You know, I don't know. That's something, I guess, that will come out uh, moving forward in, in a hearing or, or a trial. I don't know what officer knew of anybody. I know that George had criticized the police, uh, the Sanford police, openly, uh, describing them as lazy uh, before, and then had kind of... Uh, had his uh, concerns addressed, you know, he was on a ride along, he didn't like what he saw, and he had his concerns addressed by the chief, and, and uh, after that, had, uh, when someone in the Sanford police's son was involved in beating a homeless man who happened to be black, uh, Sherman Ware, uh, George, who's a Hispanic, went out to black churches all over Sanford and uh, waited for the congregation to f wrap up their service and come out to the parking lot where he handed out flyers and told people, uh, this man's not receiving justice because he's homeless and or black. And I think that you should know that because he's he's one of our brothers and sisters. And that resulted in the chief being fired, right, as I recall? I th I'm not sure if it resulted in the chief being fired or the, the person's uh, father. I th what I know happened is that that guy eventually... Uh, charges were filed against him, and he was found uh, guilty, I believe. Right, and, 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 in, and in part because of your brother's efforts. He was, was right. finally charged. That's right. And this was the son of the police chief or something like that, somebody it, it who's was, kind of protected. It and, was a higher up yeah. in, in, the, in the Sanford police. Now, your brother was accused of uttering a slur uh, when he was, quote, following uh, uh, or, or, or having his uh, uh, suspicion that Trayvon Martin was doing something bad in the neighborhood. Uh, tell us what your understanding is of that alleged slur. You know, I think it's very telling when you say your father, your son, was, or your, I'm sorry, your brother was accused of uh, saying a slur. Uh, on George's interview on, on, on Sean Hannity, he said when he heard the tape, it was very clear. On the tapes that I've heard, it's very clear what he's saying. The word is punks. I was asked about that word on the air. It wasn't a major deal that, you know, George recounted because he didn't use a racial slur. So he wouldn't have recounted, this is what happened, and here's where I said a racial slur, and then there's what happened. Now, I think it's very telling who reported that and what their motivations would be uh, to further a story, whether it's to sell more newspapers, uh, get uh, more magazine circulation, get you know a uh, sensation on the air of saying, hey, I think we hear coons because you don't have to prove what you think you hear. You can opine anything. And then once you broadcast that on the air irresponsibly, it can result in, in, in tragedy for a family. My guest is Robert Zimmerman, Jr. He is the older brother of George Zimmerman. Uh, now, Robert, you've, we've all seen instances where somebody has committed a crime and the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, let's just take the O.J. Simpson case. And then you see O.J. Simpson's uh, daughter uh, standing by him and a bunch of friends publicly saying uh, he didn't do it. Uh, and so it, it, whenever I hear a relative, a mother, a father, a brother say that my brother did not do X, Y, Z, I always understand that uh, you're not going to be the most objective person when you're evaluating what happened. 
I, so, I, so why should people believe you? Well, I think that what I'm really saying is that my brother told the truth, and it's unacceptable. I'm not saying he did or didn't do anything. I'm saying what he told was the truth, and his truth was questioned because of the word white, and I think that's a travesty for our country. I think to use any word, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, uh, to describe someone's race and therefore question their integrity is is unacceptable going forward from this. And I think that uh, what my role is for our family is to reintroduce the family. But as it relates to George, to just say, you know, please stop prejudging everything and trying everything in the media or in the court of public opinion. There is a real court where fact does come out in our country. Robert, if your brother's last name were Martinez, would you and I be having this discussion? It's hard to say, but I doubt it. Mm. Steve, can you play uh, President Obama, please? You know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. That was quite a statement. Quite a statement. And you said your brother registered Democrat, voted for Obama, and tried to convince you uh, to vote for him as well. To my understanding, he voted for Obama because he was trying to convince everyone in the family to vote for Obama because this was the man that was going to get us past race. Uh, you know, this was going to be, this was the right man for the job, not because of his race. You know, we would be a race-free, colorblind society from this point forward. And mm -hmm. then there he goes making statements Have like you had that. any contact, any outreach uh, with the Trayvon Martin family? Have they had any contact outreach to, to you? Uh... I know that my brother is barred from having any kind of contact except through his attorneys in, in matters regarding discovery uh, with with any part of uh, Trayvon's family, any member of Trayvon's family. We did on KTTV, uh, I read a statement that uh, my family all had a hand in, in crafting everyone but George because th their family had not heard from myself, uh, my father, my mother, and my sister what our feelings were at the time, what, what actually transpired, you know. Other things were reported, that we were insensitive, that we, we didn't care, that we were liars, we were racist. Our, our, our daddy judge was making up excuses and that he's a racist. And what actually happened was a young man died and we were all profoundly saddened by that. George Zimmerman's older brother, and he's speaking out on his brother's behalf. Um, when you began speaking out on your brother's behalf, uh, did you do so with George's blessing? Uh, did George uh, say, don't do it? Did George say, be careful? What was the attitude of George when you told him you were going to speak out on his behalf? Well, when I first said anything uh, to defend him, uh, he was in deep, deep hiding, and we could not communicate. And in fact, uh, that was the case for a lot of our family members. Uh, right before I went on the air on Pierce Morgan, I had a conversation with my mom. So I had my, my family's blessing, and it was uh, important that going forward, you know, now, uh, that George is not involved in what we're doing as a family because he's kind of a separate legal entity as mm -hmm. a, being a defendant, but that my entire family has uh, has a say in what I do representing them. Mm -hmm. Before we go to the phones, Robert, just a, a quick uh, summary of the evidence that I think suggests that your uh, brother did not do anything wrong, let alone uh, second-degree murder, and they include no particular order that uh, he was lawfully uh, in possession with a permit to carry a concealed weapon, uh, that uh, he was lawfully uh, looking around to make sure that uh, crime was monitored in his neighborhood. It's called uh, caring about your neighborhood, being proactive. Uh, I understand that uh, there are uh, bruises on Trayvon Martin's hands on his knuckles, indicating that your brother was telling the truth when he said the two uh, were scuffling. I understand there are uh, bruises in the back of your brother's head indicating that your brother was telling the truth when he said that Trayvon Martin got the jump on him, was banging his head on the, on his, on his, uh, on the concrete. Um, this was a story that, uh, that your brother told the cops. He was fairly consistent with that. And there was at least one witness who heard uh, a scream, and the, the scream appeared to be a scream that came from your brother. I understand that uh, the father of Trayvon Martin initially said that it wasn't Trayvon who screamed, but later That's on right. he changed and did a 180 on that. That's right. Um, so those are, I think, salient pieces of evidence, which to me, if I were a DA and somebody had brought that to me and said, um, let's, let's go after, uh, George Zimmerman for, for second degree murder, I would have said, uh, are you smoking something? My right. job as a DA is to do justice and I cannot bring charges against somebody unless I think there's a reasonable chance they're going to be convicted. And if you bring all this stuff to me. I don't see any reasonable chance for a conviction, so I'm not going to charge him. That's what I think a responsible DA would have done. However, that said, politics always enters into, into things. That's right. And, for example, when uh, the, uh, the cops who beat up Rodney King were, were mostly acquitted, uh, there were charges brought uh, under the federal uh, laws uh, arguing that the civil rights of Rodney King were violated. 
Uh, if it weren't for the political pressure to do that, the government would not have done that. I think it was the appropriate thing to do. So I'm not okay. saying that politics ought not ever enter. Right. But uh, in this case, uh, it's it's the NAACP, it's Congressional Black Caucus, it's, it's Al Sharpton, it's President of the United States weighing in on all of this. And um, as you said earlier, imagine the cashews that Angela Corey would have had to have had to say, I'm still not going to indict this man. Right. Right. It would have taken, I think, any prosecutor a tremendous amount of courage. It would have had to be really courageous. Gloria is in Yorba Linda. Gloria, you're on with Robert Zimmerman, Jr. and Larry. <laughs> hi, Larry. Uh, hi, Robert. I just wanted to say that I think your brother is going to get exonerated. And if this would have been um, where um, your brother was, was, um, was, uh, was, 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 Trayvon Martin had not been black, I think nothing, nothing like this would have ever gone on, so the best to you and your family. Thank you, sir. Well, Gloria, thank you for the call. I, I had asked you what do you think would have happened if your brother's last name had been Martinez. I didn't ask you what would have happened if Trayvon Martin had been white or, or Hispanic. What do you think? Well, I know that uh, I, I know being his George's brother, I don't think he would have made any distinction about uh, anybody's race. He, he never has. Uh, they made m much ado about that word coon, which he never said and would never say. I don't think anybody's used that word in 40 years. But George uh, does not make distinctions in race as to whether something is is worth doing or not worth doing that's why he mentored black children uh you know their their father those children is serving a life sentence in prison and he he knew that they needed some kind of role model uh positive role model in their life uh to not be let down uh by society generally and sometimes that's just a volunteer who just cares and reaches out from themselves regardless of children's race i, I appreciate your answer but but i w i guess i was asking and i apologize for phrasing it so badly mm -hmm. what i meant was do you think there would be the same kind of outcry if oh. uh, trayvon martin had been white same fact pattern same thing but, but instead of trayvon martin being black he's white you know it's hard to tell i don't think that the white community has al sharpton's or jesse jackson's or uh congressional black caucuses you know they're they're, they're just uh, uh i think you know a, they're, they're an entity that had an agenda, those entities, financial and other, and, and uh, the time will come that that agenda is revealed as time goes on. But I, it's hard to say, but I doubt it. That's just my own opinion. Val is a retired police officer. Val, you are on with Robert Zimmerman and Larry. Uh, thanks a lot, Larry. Uh, first of all, Robert, I, I, personally speaking, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming out and talking about this issue because I think it is important that we understand the dynamics that are at play here. As far as with Larry, uh, you could have picked a better person to stand up to controversy. So, Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm very glad to have you on. Let me let me address the issue about the hoodie since everyone's made such a big deal about that. Uh, one thing I will mention in my experience, both as a law enforcement officer and then as a private citizen, a lot of young people today, by the way, regardless of their race, creed, or color, a lot of them wear a hoodie in impolite areas, as I call it, that is a restaurant, a store, a, re a bar even, uh, to be mysterious, to be perceived as mysterious, to be perceived as threatening or intimidating. There's no other reason for them to do it. When hoodies first came around when I was, when I was a boy playing in sports, it was designed to help keep you warm. It, there, the interest was is that while you're sitting on the bench for a while, uh, in between plays or in between sets, you have the hoodie on to keep the, the, your temperature down and basically keep your 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 uh, your, your outside temperature uh, under control. Today, it's become some kind of a statement. Uh, I think the only reason somebody wears one is for the reasons I've just stated before. I've had this experience with young people a number of times. When I first went law enforcement, uh, when I left, first left law enforcement, became uh, for a friend uh, temporarily a doorman for at a bar. And one of the things that was interesting that I experienced was a young man came up to me in a very demeaning and arrogant manner. His uh, driver's license said he wouldn't be 21 for another eight months. And when I pointed that out to him, the scornful way he spoke to me, he was wearing a hoodie, by the way, the scornful way he spoke to me actually just amazed me. He had the nerve to say to me, look, man, I already told you I'm going to be 21 in eight months. In other words, I was the idiot. You cannot reason with people who have that kind of philosophy on it. Well, so what are you saying, Val? I mean, how, how do we know that uh, Trayvon Martin had that kind of attitude? All, all, all you're telling me is that you once had an encounter I with will. somebody wearing a hoodie, and, and therefore you've, you've got an, uh, a, a, an attitude about people who wear hoodies. Uh, I would say I do, actually, mm -hmm. because my experience has been that there's an, a lot of arrogance, an awful lot of attitude coming from people 
in certain age groups. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you asked me that because I know I wasn't specific. What I'm what I'm saying is, you walk into a bar and you're wearing a hoodie. This is a social environment. Why are you wearing the hoodie? There's no reason to be wearing the hoodie. How can anybody talk to you? I actually even confronted one young man who came to the, was already inside legally inside the bar and asked him, "Just why are you wearing the hoodie?" Oh, I, I just like to, man. It's cool. Well, I can't see your face. What do you need to see my face for? Because when I'm talking to you, I just want to see your expression. It's a very, very normal event. The hoodie, to me, suggests that you are trying, as I said, to be uh, intimidating and or mysterious. Uh, Assume, Val, for a moment that it was the hoodie that caused George Zimmerman to be suspicious about Trayvon Martin. Uh, and because of the hoodie, because hmm, uh, it's been my experience that when I've seen people wear hoodies, uh, they're up to no good. And that's what prompted it. Now, what's your analysis after that? Well, I, I, now, there I will draw a little, a very fine line about that. I am not saying because you're wearing a hoodie, that's what, that's what you're intending. I'm saying what you're projecting and what it suggests to me. Oftentimes, it's just a persona thing. You're trying to project that you're something that you're not. You're coming but very, I, you're coming very close, Val, to saying wearing a hoodie gives you probable cause to, uh, to, uh, question somebody. Well, it couldn't have because on a number of occasions I've come across kids walking into the street who I did think were suspicious. The hoodie didn't help, but mm-hmm. I did not use the hoodie mm-hmm. as a re- I'm saying I don't have to say this now. I'm retired. I don't do this job anymore. But if I saw guys wearing hoodies, that wasn't necessarily the thing that would draw my attention. It was their demeanor and where they were at and the hour they were there and likely their age. Oh, okay, Val, thank you for the call of second-degree murder uh, in the case of Trayvon Martin. Ray is in Santa Clarita. Ray, how you doing? Hey, thank you for taking my call, Larry. Sure. Uh, I have a couple statements. I'll make them brief. First statement is, it's never okay to indict the family uh, for something another family member does. But it's another for the family to indict itself in ill-advised PR campaign. And second... Why, why, uh, why, do, you, why do you think this is ill-advised, Ray? Well, uh, just the whole tone of, you know, our guy's innocent, you're, you know, the other guy is guilty automatically. Trayvon had com- committed no crimes that evening. He was guilty of nothing. He was an innocent person. And because of that, and because of the actions of George Newman, uh, that boy's life was taken. Whether intentionally, unintentionally, that's for a jury to decide. But uh, as to the case, my, my point was going to be simple. You said something yourself, Larry, that uh, you believe in a fair investigation in the case. Mm-hmm. And in this case, the original homicide detective who investigated the case actually swore out a murder complaint against George Zimmerman. In fact, his words were simple, saying that he did not believe George Zimmerman's account of what happened. It was the DA who rejected that sworn complaint. So a proper investigation was done initially. And lastly... Well, well that's, and Ray, that's right. That's exactly what, what uh, Robert said. Robert said a, there was a proper and thorough investigation, but people right. didn't realize how, how thorough it was. Yeah, but Robert... And, 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 Robert and, and Ray, and Ray it's, not, it's not uncommon. I told you before, I was a, uh, a law clerk for the DA's office. It's not uncommon for a detective to feel that charges should be brought and for the DA to say, no, I, I don't think I'm going to get a conviction. That happens all the time. Yeah, There's well, nothing, nothing nefarious about that. Well, no, there's nothing nefarious about it, but the simple fact remains that the original homicide detective who handled the case simply swore out a complaint charging him with second-degree murder in this case based on George Zimmerman's own words, which, according to Robert Zimmerman, was the truth. And that's my point. If George Zimmerman's initial recording of this incident was the truth, and the original homicide detective took that truth and charged him with a crime, then there has to be something more to the case than what I'm hearing today on your show. Uh, uh, well, what about that, uh, Robert? Uh, he's right about the detective swearing out a complaint initially. I, I, I know I've right. read that. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, vaguely familiar with that. It's, it was, um, I'm not sure that he said uh, second-degree murder. You know, And again, that's really something for George's lawyer to respond to. I'm not sure that he said second-degree murder, but I think what's come out about that uh, detective, if he's speaking about uh, Chris Serena, was this was the guy who has not yet explained he's been reassigned to foot patrol because what he did was uh, take an unauthorized video on his iPhone of George walking in the station and then transferred that video to a network. I believe it was ABC News. 
uh, that uh, showed George having, you know, apparently no injuries, which we know is completely false. Now, I don't know why a detective would do th- I think there is something nefarious about that, why they would do something uh, in order to uh, re- record what would be evidence but have the upper hand on when it got leaked. You know, I, I think that's strange. I think it's telling he was reassigned. I don't have any internal knowledge of Sanford mm-hmm. uh, police or anything like that. So. Um, I know you've given a statement, uh, and uh, I want to give you one more chance to say anything to, uh, to to the community, not so much necessarily to Trayvon Martin's family. If you say you're sorry and you already have, uh, I don't know that that's going to do a, a whole lot of good given the pain that they're in. But I would like you to kind of address society, the, the, the people that believe that, uh, that uh, your brother was not charged because he was white, the people who believe that... Uh, black people are routinely hunted down, uh, terms that were used by people like Jesse Jackson. What, what, is your, what, what message do you want to give to society? I think uh, it'd be remiss if I didn't thank, first of all, the people uh, who opened their, uh, their, their homes uh, to shelter us, their hearts to pray for us, uh, their airwaves uh, to uh, host us, such as yourself, and uh, their prayers have sustained us, first and foremost. Um, I think that uh, a good message to take from all of this is that we should be a society that's based on dialogue and examination of fact. And I, I even remember President Obama, you know, uh, his, his sort of catchphrase was, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And I cannot describe what has been happening as anything more than, you know, disagreeable at best. Uh, it, it's, it's borders on violence at worst. I think that when we do have... Uh, fair questions and and when we do have a dialogue about race about crime about inequality generally there are uh... real questions to ask and we do have to have a soul searching but i think that when we jump to conclusion based on those questions because they just involve race uh... and and uh... therefore one thing went down this way or that we're really doing a disservice to ourselves and the future generations of americans who are going to look back on this without any any uh... any solace in the outcome George Zerman's older brother, Robert Zerman Jr. Robert, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for having listened to this very.